Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, we'll look at what to expect from the spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. We're looking ahead to German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's trip to China amid trade tensions with the EU. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. We look ahead to a ton of eco data in China. And as usual, we hunt for a catalyst that might fire up the Chinese economic engine. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, DAB. Be Digital Radio London, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with the spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank. This coming week, central bank leaders and finance ministers from around the world gather in Washington, D.C., to discuss interest rates, monetary policy, and other issues of global concern. For more on what to expect, we're joined by Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Well, Michael, in a written statement to be delivered this week, the managing director of the IMF says it'll push its global growth forecast slightly higher, up one notch to 3.2% in 2025. That's despite stubbornly high inflation, massive debt loads. What's behind that? rather upbeat assessment. <laughs> the fact that uh, the economy of the United States in particular, but other economies around the world, have been able to grow faster than people anticipated coming out of the recession. Now, we've talked many, many times about the weirdness of this uh, pandemic recession and how it has uh, upended all kinds of economic ideas and forecasts. And the IMF is just reflecting what reality is that uh, whether we understand it or not, things are better than we had thought. Well, the IMF predicting U.S. growth this year, 2.1 percent. It's not going to blow anyone away, but it's pretty steady. And actually a drop in 2025, 1.7 percent. Why is that? There's a feeling that we can't sustain this growth level, but I don't think there's a whole lot of confidence behind that prediction. Uh, the other thing that's important to realize about the uh, world economic outlook, which is what the IMF will be uh, putting out next week with actual numbers, and basically um, nobody pays any attention to to the numbers they generate for the U.S. and the European Union and uh, the United Kingdom, Japan, China, because there are people, thousands of people paid around the world to do that. Where the IMF uh, does get some interest is especially people who trade in emerging markets because those aren't covered as well and they really do have the depth of information about what's going on in those countries. There's not a lot of value add to say the U.S. is going to grow 2.1 percent when the Fed is already saying it's going to grow 2.1 percent and everybody on Wall Street is weighing in yeah. on how much it's going to grow. So it's those sleeper countries, like you said, not Japan, not the Eurozone, not China. Mm -hmm. But uh, the ones maybe on the back burner. Right. Yeah, yeah. Frontier markets, emerging markets. Okay. Now, China forecasting pretty solid growth. That's not exactly a sluggish economy, is it? It's just not what we're used to seeing in China. Right. They have, they've started to run into the law of large numbers that it's really hard to keep improving at the same rate when you start to get as large as their economy is right now. They're also going through something of a recession there and a real credit issue problem. So uh, we don't know there isn't a lot of faith, put it that way, in Chinese economic data. So we don't know for sure how fast they're growing. And it is interesting to see uh, what the IMF will say, because there are a lot of private sector economists who think China's growing a lot more slowly than the numbers that China will put out. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the, the only odd thing about it, or not odd thing about it, but the, the only thing is, is it's really hard to invest in China. So it's not like... Um, you're going to be using a lot of these numbers just to uh, to readjust your portfolio. Got it. Well, one thing that we know is going to be talked about, and that is interest rates. Uh, we saw Christine Lagarde from the ECB just this week holding steady 
We know uh, here we're in sort of a holding pattern in the U.S. on interest rates, at least maybe even till later in the year. What What's going to be the big discussion? Well, you know, when they, they were meeting last fall, there was a lot of talk about interest rates eventually coming down because we – sort of gotten through the recession and uh, we'd sort of gotten through inflation and things were getting better. And now the conversation is going to be different because the major central banks are all stepping back from the precipice of rate cuts, uh, with the exception of the ECB, because they're at this point still worried about the possibility of inflation resurging. Uh, the conversations at the IMF meetings, World Bank meetings, uh, will be basically around the idea of synchronicity. Will everybody be moving at once, or will somebody move much faster than everyone else? Uh, and in her news conference last week, uh, Christine Lagarde was asked about that, because what happens is if you cut your interest rate and others don't, then uh, your currency is going to fall. And uh, it, it's just more attractive to invest in the higher rate countries. Uh, she did not want to comment on that, but you can bet that's going to be one of the discussion points behind closed doors uh, at the meetings. And another one, uh, because of all this geopolitical risk out there in the Middle East, Ukraine and Russia, I mean, that has got to be also forefront on the agenda. What to do and when to do it? Well, this is an opportunity for a lot of discussions because the uh, finance and foreign ministers from all over the world come and attend along with central bankers uh, these meetings, and they have a lot of uh, meetings together. And so that sort of thing will get discussed. You just can't expect any kind of answers or, or uh, you know, conclusions about what should be done, uh, because if they haven't got it right now, just a, a, a few more meetings in Washington next week aren't going to make a difference. No, and and the meetings are here. What what role does the U.S. play? In, in these meetings and in the World Bank and the IMF? Well, the U.S. is the host. We're the biggest economy in the world, and we have perhaps the best infrastructure for bringing all of these people together from the disparate uh, countries of the world. And so uh, twice a year, uh, they come to the U.S. And they, and they hold the IMF and World Bank meetings. And we're the headquarters for the IMF and the World Bank. So this is the place uh, where they, they can get things done. Well, uh, it's a lot to look forward to. Our thanks to Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Next week, we get a sense of how cautious consumers are being with their money. We get U.S. retail sales data for March. That's out on Monday. Also, how could this possibly impact Fed policy going forward? And for more, we're joined by Anna Wong, Bloomberg Chief U.S. Economist. So, Anna, what are you expecting to see in the March retail sales number? Right. Um, we are expecting to see a tepid number. I think there are various signs pointing to consumers being exhausted by the price increases over the past two years. We saw that uh, in March, uh, purchases of cars has fallen sharply, and that was following a rebound in February after another slump in January. But if you smooth over the first three months of the year, it is uh, clearly showing a slowdown. And that's consistent with what we're seeing and also auto loans rejections. It's, it's harder to get financing to, to auto loans, uh, given that um, auto loan rates are still pretty high. And for the category of retail that directly go into Q1 GDP, it's the control groups sales, which excludes vehicles, gasoline, food services, and, and building materials, we are expecting a tepid 0.2% gains. That's versus 0% in the previous month. I think that overall, the U.S. consumption will be growing at about a 2% pace in the first quarter. And that's a slow down from the more than 3% in the fourth quarter. And I think that as we go into the year, the slowdown will further be more evident. And by the end of the year, we're only expecting a 1% quarterly growth in PCE spending. So a steady decline in spending. Do you attribute this mostly to inflation? I mean, everywhere you go, everything costs more. Every time you, you go to the store, you go out to dinner, you look at a, a sticker on a car, everything. Yeah, it's, it's both a combination of inflation um, and also increasing job insecurity, layoffs, announcements have risen in news headlines and that naturally could make people more cautious and that would 
uh, how that t- translates to spending behavior is that people would think, okay, I don't know if I'm on the chopping block next, I better not spend as much. And so saving rates should overall increase as a result of this caution. So in the March CPI report that was released last week, we saw that a few consumer categories uh, prices fall. Uh, so for example, recreational goods and consumer electronics were two categories in the core goods category that saw very sharp decline in prices. And I think that reflects that the discretionary component of consumer budget is being slimmed down because they have to pay, you know, 20% higher for auto insurance. And auto insurance is uh, non-negotiable. It's a big part of uh, uh, consumer spending because everybody needs to drive a car. And as a result, what we are seeing is less spending on things that could be cut. And that will show up in the retail as well, that I think the retail goods component, discretionary goods spending, will see a a decline, uh, whereas most of the spending is coming from services and which is benefiting from the stock uh, rally in the the past uh, couple months. And people who are primarily uh, spending and services are the are the people who who are benefiting from the market rally, which and they tend to be older people, baby boomers. So. That's a two-track economy for you. Well, another thing I want to talk to you about, non-discretionary, is the price at the gas pump, which has been going up steadily since the start of the year. AAA predicting gas will average 4 bucks a gallon by the summer. How will that affect budgets and spending? So gasoline and food, especially for the lower-income household, account for more than a fifth of their budget. So it will definitely squeeze the budget. It's not a very comforting thing for for a household. The only thing that could offset that somewhat is the hike in minimum wage uh, across many states early in the year. So in California, we just saw early this month uh, in April that fast food uh, workers minimum wage have been increased by uh, by almost 20%. And in Florida, for example, early this year, the state uh, hiked minimum wage by 17%. So there's still hope for the lower income household who could see, you know, 10 to 20% jump in their wages. March retail sales data out on Monday. And our thanks to Anna Wong, Bloomberg Chief U.S. Economist. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, why Germany's chancellor is heading to China. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a look at some key economic data coming out of China. But first, as China's economy struggles to recover, diplomatic relations become more crucial. On the heels of U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to Beijing last week, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz set to visit the region in the coming days. For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor, Stephen Carroll. Tom, Janet Yellen went to China with the message that Beijing's manufacturing drive is a threat to other economies. Her comments, at times strongly worded, were respectfully received by her hosts, but aren't likely to result in a policy shift. So as Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz makes the trip to Beijing, can he hope for any more? European countries have taken a different approach to their relationship with China versus what the United States is doing. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has described the strategy as de-risking rather than decoupling. That hasn't stopped the EU launching a competition investigation into Chinese subsidies for green industries. Olaf Scholz will be conscious that German companies are a major exporter to China, so he must be cautious. A recent survey by the German Chamber of Commerce in China highlighted the challenges that many Western firms have mentioned before. Two-thirds of those operating in the country say they face unfair competition in the market, a problem that threatens to push up their costs and erode profit margins. Schultz's discussions in China will also be set against a backdrop of geopolitical unrest, continued tensions in the Middle East and Russia's invasion of Ukraine are set to feature heavily during the upcoming G7 foreign ministers meeting in Italy. I've been discussing the implication of Schultz's visit to China and that meeting with Bloomberg's EMEA News Director Rosalind Matheson. I started by asking her how different Schultz's time in China will be to that of the trip by US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. 
Well, it'll be similar but also a bit different, as you say, because the relationship between China and Germany is a bit different to the relationship between China and the US, although there are similarities in terms of the challenges around the business environment. And so you can expect that the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz will be echoing uh, some of what Janet Yellen was saying on her recent trip, um, the challenges for German companies operating their clarity around that business environment, um, certainty around supply chains. Um, Specifically, though, for him, the issue of electric vehicles will probably come up again and the tensions over uh, Chinese support for their companies and the broader EU probe that's going on um, into that support. So there'll be some similarities around the messaging that's going to come from Olaf Scholz, but also Germany's tended to take a slightly more careful line about the overall relationship. The US has been willing to criticise China more overtly on the human rights front, for example, um, and over what they see as its militarization of areas like the South China Sea, tensions with Taiwan. That doesn't mean that Olaf Scholz won't bring those things up, but um, he, Germany is a, it traditionally has just been a bit more cautious about some of their rhetoric because they really need uh, the economic relationship with China to work. Yeah, I mean, the President of the European Commission has used this expression, de-risking, not de when it comes to the relationship with China. Does, is Olaf Schultz likely to step outside of that in his comments as he's meeting officials? Well, so far he's really maintained, by and large, the sort of the tone taken by his predecessor, Angela Merkel. Um, and she was very much about, you know, similarly with other countries like Russia, I would add, keeping the dialogue going, keeping the conversation going, preserving the economic and trade relationship out of the view that if you bind yourselves economically um, and through investment and trade, then you're more likely to to be able to behave better with each other on the political side. And that's very much the sort of the tone and philosophy adopted by Olaf Scholz since he came to power. And of course, as someone who was very much part of the Merkel era himself, he has gotten a bit harder, I would say, than Angela Merkel did on the political front. But that's also because Germany is under pressure within Europe to take that harder line. You see France, you see the UK, you see the EU as a whole pressing China quite heavily um, on its behaviour over trade, over market access, over its tech companies um, and over its behaviour around things like human rights. And Germany's been seen as a bit of an outlier. So he's been pushed quite heavily by his French counterpart, Emmanuel Macron, to do that. So you might see that slightly harder tone, but generally he's been consistent with his predecessor's policy. Because part of this trip will involve Olaf Schultz also visiting German companies that operate in China. A survey from the German Chamber of Commerce in China found that two thirds of German companies that operate in the country say they face unfair competition in the market. I mean, realistically, does Olaf Schultz have any leverage to tackle something like that, given that, you know, even Janet Yellen seemed to have difficulty in in getting any actual movement? Very unlikely. Um, If Janet Yellen can't succeed, I wouldn't imagine that Olaf Schultz will. I mean, those surveys that show that companies, you know, German companies or British companies or American companies are complaining about the environment in China are are very, very common. Um, And that sort of figure is not surprising because those concerns are are long-standing about the ability to have clarity around market access and Chinese support for their own industry and so on. So that's not going to, I think, affect Olaf Scholz on his trip, although it does sort of show, again, the need to really um, be showing that he's listening to those concerns. Um, But is the Chinese leadership going to take their cues from Germany? Probably not. What they are interested potentially doing is bifurcating a bit because China's quite good at trying to play countries a bit against each other and what they might do is you know they'll have a certain tone with Germany that they won't have with the US for example they'll be keen to keep Germany probably closer in the tent right now because that's to their advantage to to have that kind of sense of potential disunity in Europe over a China policy so it's all about playing those kind of games really and so they're not going to change their policy simply because Olaf Scholz asked them to. They certainly wouldn't do it even if Janet Yellen asked them to because they're really playing their own game there. But it'll be interesting to see how you know, or whether they try and, and, and keep Germany peeled off from the rest of the pack. Because, I mean, there is something in common that, that China and Germany have is, is weakness in their economies as well for slightly different reasons. Are there matters of common ground that we could see sort of flagship announcements or, or uh, you know, issues where they, they emerge with some positive cooperation? 
Well, certainly it's not just a one-way street, and that's a really important point that you make. I mean, obviously, Germany and the US need China um, economically and for business, but China also needs them for business. The Chinese economy has been quite weak of late. It's showing a few green shoots at the moment, but certainly it's nowhere on the level that it was some years ago pre-pandemic. And Xi Jinping is very consciously aware of that. He does need his economy to be stable. And so there are some mutual interests there. You can imagine there'll be lots of positive rhetoric in a way like there was with Janet Yellen also about the relationship, about being open for business, about China being ready to engage with these companies. That obviously, you know, doesn't necessarily reflect reality, but there'll be that rhetoric and that sense of mutual need. You can also imagine there'll be conversations around areas of mutual interest globally between Germany and China. And one key one there obviously is is Russia's actions in Ukraine with the war there. You can imagine there'll be conversation around that. There'll be conversation around the Middle East um, and the war in Gaza. There'll be conversations around disruptions to shipping and global supply chains. So some of those broader topics will definitely come up. Of course, and, and some of those issues issues are also going to feature at the other big geopolitical event in the coming days, which is the G7 foreign ministers meeting that's happening in Italy. What are we likely to hear on things like Russia-Ukraine at that meeting? Well, certainly you're going to expect general expressions of support for Ukraine, of unity, because the G7 has been very unified in general around the need to keep supporting Ukraine. And what you may see, of course, is 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 disagreements over in what way to keep supporting Ukraine, because, of course, the US is sitting on a very, very big aid package for months that's unlikely to be unlocked anytime soon in a sense that maybe Europe is left holding the can um, more than they did previously for military and, and financial support for Ukraine. So that's definitely going to be one topic for conversation is that they all need to be pulling their weight when it comes to that. There'll probably be conversations with Ukraine uh, on the table in terms of the future of the war. Is there a need at some point to crack open the door to negotiations with Russia? Does there have to be some sense of of getting a deal um, as this war goes on? And Ukraine certainly is, is on the back foot a bit, at least on the ground inside Ukraine itself. So that will probably be the two major topics when it comes to Ukraine and then that broader conversation around how Europe can beef up its own defence and its own defence spending. That's our EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. Now, as Ros was telling us, geopolitical tensions high on the agenda at the G7 meeting. The wars in Ukraine and Gaza led to calls for countries to increase defence spending. And Bloomberg Economics recently estimated that an increase to 4% of GDP sought by some would cost governments of G7 countries more than $10 million per year over the next decade. Global economist Bhargavi Shuktawail joined us on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe to discuss their forecasts. So we looked at two specific scenarios for defense spending, one in which U.S. and its partners spend at least 2% of their debt uh, of their GDP on defense. And then we looked at a more extreme scenario, which emulates the Cold War level. So if they raise defense spending to 4%. For countries like Germany and Canada, with relatively low levels of forecasted debt and fiscal headroom, this higher spending may be painful, but it's actually feasible. But for a lot of governments, especially Japan, Italy, and maybe even France, they're going to struggle a lot to increase defense spending substantially without there being additional spending cuts somewhere, higher taxes, additional debt, or some combination of the lot. Uh, France, Italy, and Spain would be particularly exposed if the, ex- ex- if the extra funding um, spending is funded by borrowing, with Italy's public debt jumping to 179% of output by 2034 from 144% this year. For the U.S., which is already spending 3.3% on defense, Debt could still increase to 131% from 99% this year over the next decade if we pushed up military spending to 4%. That's where we get the $10 trillion number from the U.S. and major allies together. If they were to reach such levels, that's going to be a large number. Is an increase of defense spending to 2%, which is the sort of NATO goal, would that be enough to meet the challenges? What's the sort of thinking behind that? In Europe, there's been this, this particularly in this need to catch up because its industry has been shrinking after years of low spending on defense. Particularly, like we've been see, seeing these new style of wars in Ukraine um, with a lot more uh, focus on air defense. And allies will need to invest in more on that in air defense and ammunition. And there's also these plans for NATO to put as many as 300,000 troops on higher readiness. And all of that is going to cost a lot of, lot of money. And there's also promise of aid to Kyiv which needs to happen 
And some officials are pointing to Cold War levels where NATO's allies spent about 3 to 4% on defence as what may be needed to deal with these threats. That was Global Economist at Bloomberg Economics, Bargavi Shukdawell, speaking to myself and Caroline Hepker. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Stephen. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look ahead at some key economic data in China. Could there be signs of recovery for the slumping Chinese economy? I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. We'll be getting a slew of economic data out of China this week, including GDP, industrial production, and retail sales data. Let's get to Bloomberg Daybreak Asia hosts Brian Curtis and Doug Krisner as we look for signs of recovery in the Chinese economy. Tom, China may be close to turning the corner on its economic recovery, but the jury is still out. Manufacturing picked up in March, and risk assets have seen a bounce of late, but consumer activity has lagged. And in the coming week, we'll get retail sales numbers along with data on home prices that would be both new and used. These data could give us some insight into the health of the Chinese consumer. Can consumers emerge from the doldrums and get the economy going again? We put that question to Mark Conan at AIA. Coming out of the pandemic and then uh, uncertainty around policy, the, the confusion around geopolitics, the weakness on the currency, the deflation, the cutting rates, all of these have compounded upon sentiment. And I think it's going to take a, a little bit longer for people to recover from that and for us to see a significant improvement within consumption. That's at an aggregate level. But of course, within, the, within that picture, there are those that are prospering, that are able to, to offer a relative advantage and are, are continuing to make progress. Well, joining us now to discuss the plight of the Chinese consumer is Eric Ju, Bloomberg economist covering China and Hong Kong, and Jenny Marsh, team leader for Greater China EcoGov. Welcome to you both. We're glad you can help us take a look at what's happening with the Chinese domestic economy. A moment ago, Mark Conan mentioned that there have been some winners of late. Two areas of the economy seeing a pickup are manufacturing and exports. Exports so far this year have surprised on the upside for China, as we've seen. You know, the rest of the world has perhaps continued to grow uh, more vigorously than was expected. China has has benefited from that, but that transition towards more of a domestic focus for the economy is certainly a long-term policy aim. That's Mark Conan at AIA talking about both internal and external inputs into Chinese growth. We thought for the discussion today that we would focus a little bit more on domestic consumption and what it takes to get consumers going again. Jenny, how important is it for the Chinese economy to see some sort of turn up in consumption and is it coming? It's absolutely crucial that they see a turn up and upswing in consumption um, because they cannot rely on the factory floor alone to sort of turn the economy around this year. Um, there have been some green shoots, you know, um, over the recent Qingmen holiday. Tourists spent more per trip uh, than any time since 2019. So, you know, that was encouraging. But, you know, outside these sort of big holiday events where pent up demand is being released, um, there's still a lot of pressures on the on people and the sort of the general household. You know, the property crisis is still weighing on confidence. Um, you know, and you can see um, that the CPI is sort of a reflection of that weak demand. You know, the people are not buying enough, and therefore prices are continuing to sort of uh, feel these deflationary pressures at the moment. Eric, the services economy is a very broad category. We know that, but when you look at the sentiment vis-a-vis the official PMI data, what do we know about business? sentiment in the services industries? I think uh, if you look at uh, PMI you know, services in early this year, I think uh, it's generally show that uh, they, they are doing well during the holiday, but uh, if you look at periods outside of a quality, you know, those consumption, those high frequency data actually show that uh, people are not really spending much except for the holiday. And even if you look at holiday data, we just got the early April holiday, and the, the per day, you know, the per capita spending was still uh, not as strong as before, right? So you, you see, yeah, lots of people are traveling, 
but they're not really spending as much. So the, some part of it can be, you know, some cultural shift, right? Young people, they no longer spend a lot of money on shopping around. They did they, they more value experience, you know, in the travels. And we also see similar pattern even in overseas tourism. If we look at data from a uh, visitor from uh, China in Hong Kong, in Japan, we did some analysis and see it's a very similar story. People... Uh, coming back to those uh, tourist visits, but uh, they're not really spending as much as before. It seems yeah. like housing is at the root of, of a lot of the spending issues, that people just don't feel yeah. so confident with their overall wealth and about their security economically going forward. And so we need to see some improvement there. And Eric, um, let me put a question to you that's tied to policy making. We, we did see a few newspapers talking about this uh, just in the past couple of days, about cities removing some of the lower limits for mortgage mm -hmm. rates on first-time home buying and generally just loosening the strings a little bit on, on housing policies. Um, is that going to work? I have to say those incremental, those uh, small steps, it has proved that it's not working very well so mm -hmm. far. I think since the second half of last year, we've seen lots of you know easing uh, steps on, from local governments on loosening uh, mortgage uh, rates and you know relaxing some home purchase rules. But it's, it's all step by step, small loosening, and uh, we haven't seen any you know big impact from those policies. So that's, that suggests so you, you, you probably need a more aggressive, you know, more proactive uh, easing steps. Someone would suggest that you, you should relax, remove, just like Hong Kong, remove all the home purchasing, mm. you know, relax uh, the, the, the restrictions, especially in the tier one cities in China. Jenny, last year, I think the government unveiled a plan to boost household spending on everything from electric appliances to furniture, things like that. How is that working? Is it been a an effective prescription to try to revitalize a bit of spending? Not so far. So this is the sort of uh, cash for clunkers program they rolled out. And it's really the government's sort of big swing at trying to boost uh, consumer spending, essentially um, raising the standards for electronics across a broad range of sectors, forcing people to sort of hand in their old goods and, and buy new ones. Um, it's very, I think that it's going to be rolled out sort of in a piecemeal way, province by province. Um, and we've been monitoring closely to sort of watch for the beginning of this program. And we haven't yet seen signs that it has sort of been put into effect. But, you know, the rollout is, uh, has been quite slow so far. So we're not going to see the effects from it yet. There was a note this week saying it could uh, raise GDP by 0.9% when you look at the industrial impact of everything that would need to be manufactured for the program. So it could be significant, but it's going to be rolled out over a series of years and uh, it hasn't yet come into effect. Recently, in a discussion about the latest uh, CPI and PPI data, we caught up with Wei Yao, chief economist uh, for the Asia Pacific at Songjian. And it was kind of interesting because, you know, it was a mixed bag. You had very negative PPI, but everybody expected that, and it was in line. Consumer prices, as you mentioned earlier, Jenny, uh, they did advance, but only just, uh, just 0.1%. So what was interesting was I, I mentioned to Wei Yao, well, at least that's a little bit of positive news, and we can listen to her answer here. She also started to bring in policy in China. Maybe it's just a wee bit of good news, but I think structurally things haven't really changed much. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the economic situation in China, it continued to be a challenge of not enough domestic demand and a lot of supply. So this uh, and the policy on the policy front, there is not much significant to address this issue. So Jenny, if we were looking at policy, if we had you know a wish list of things that we thought would be necessary to be done by the policymakers to get consumers moving, what would be high on your list? I think there are no quick fixes. I mean, they could offer consumers um, sort of direct stimulus, i.e., sort of giving them cash handouts to boost spending. But you know, if you do that, the underlying structural problems still remain, right? So you'll still have the property crisis there, which is really underpinning household wealth and sort of the root of a lot of the problems. You know, when Janet Yellen came to Beijing uh, last week, and she basically advocated sort of a rethink of um, the Chinese economic policy in order to boost consumption, rebalance the economy. And the things that she was proposing were not short-term suggestions. You know, she was saying, improve pension security, make education more affordable, you know, um, things that make people feel like they don't need to keep saving because of this high household saving rate in China. People 
the, the social security net isn't there. Mm. If something happens and you fall very ill, you know, you're going to have to pay for your medical care. Um, you know, you need to save for your retirement because there isn't a good state funded pension program. So th this is all part of the broader framework and there's no easy fix, in my opinion, for getting people spending again. Obviously, if things improve and the economy looks better, people will feel more buoyed. But, you know, there's some big problems there and these are sort of deep seated spending habits. So playing off that, Eric, I'm wondering if you're a policymaker, would you necessarily push banks into reducing deposit rates? as a way of discouraging savings and maybe forcing some more money, more liquidity into the economy? That could be helped, but I think the fundamental problem the policymaker needs to address is the expectation of the household and the business, right? So in the past, it's everybody expecting that the economy is booming, right? The property market is booming, so I'm going to you know, make more money and, and my, my, my property is going to worth more in the future. So it's it's okay for me to you know spend more now but i think now the expectation is kind of you know reverse right so everybody was expecting they're having probably harder time uh, looking forward especially you know giving you see lots of news about you know uh, so some some financial sector they're cutting uh, salaries right they're cutting you know uh, payments so so i think that the people's uh, expectation is not very high at this moment with the economy slowing with lots of uh, restrictive kind of regulation trying to, you know, uh, contain the income growth and that's put uh, more pressure on, you know, people feeling if really my life is going to get better, you know, looking forward. So <laughs> I would probably, you know, spend, uh, save more and now you know, just to prepare for worse days. There are some technical reasons, too, sometimes what people don't spend. For instance, the government mm -hmm. just asked hotels to accept foreign credit cards for people traveling. Yes. Uh, could could the Chinese authorities do more to, to try to really stimulate domestic tourism, light a fire there, and even encourage people to go to Macau? I think people are really going there, right? but I, I'm not sure if they're really spending go to the <laughs> those casinos because they they really they, they they're not as you know as willing to spend as before. So it's not really only on spending money on purchasing goods. It's also applied to you know spending money on gambling. Jenny, I, I'm curious about uh, the degree to which the story on weak domestic demand is tied to a labor market that may be struggling, particularly where young people are concerned. Is that a part of the narrative here? Yeah. You know, you've got very strong uh, youth unemployment. And even the overall employment rate last month uh, erased all the gains that it had made since the previous uh, six months. So you're seeing a decline in employment rates overall. So you have this weak labor market. So the overall landscape for the Chinese consumer is is pretty poor. I do think on the sort of the sentiment side, the flip of it is after three years of COVID, there is pent up demand for experiences. And people are sort of excited about traveling. We're seeing that in the numbers, but they're changing how they're spending. So they're preferring to go to third and fourth tier cities. It's not as a high value spending um, as before. We'll have to leave it there. Jenny, thanks so much for joining us. Jenny Marsh, team leader for Greater China EcoGov at Bloomberg, and Eric Ju, Bloomberg economist covering China and Hong Kong. I'm Brian Curtis here in Hong Kong, along with Doug Krisner. You can catch us every weekday for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 8 a.m. in Hong Kong and 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Doug. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on the markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.